Hello and welcome to season eight of the Writing Community Chat Show. I am super excited uh, to be here. And if you have been watching this or listened to this since the very beginning, I thank you sincerely. Uh, it's been a mighty fine journey and I've had some incredible guests on. Season eight is no different. Um, tonight's guest is one of my favorite authors and he's written one of my favorite books by far. And so I'm very excited to get into that tonight. Um, if you are new to the show, hello and welcome. And um, please consider hitting that subscribe button because there are a lot of discussions coming up this year and the panel show is coming back as well. So there'll be a lot of those coming up. Um, this is pre-recorded back in November, hence it not being live, which might be unusual to a lot of you. And today is my birthday, um, not in November. In fact, on the 13th of January, while you're watching this, it will be my birthday. So I'm most likely sat on the other side of the screen with a beer um, in the chat. So say hello and very weird, but my, <laughs> my name is Chris and you are watching the Writing Community Chat Show. So welcome, and tonight's guest is uh, an absolute, um, a very exciting guest uh, for me. So as it's my birthday, I'm super, super happy to be having this guest on, and I'm sure a lot of you, and I know a lot of you actually in the chat groups are very excited about this as well. So I'm not going to ramble on too much. I'm going to introduce tonight's guest. Um, tonight's guest is um, he, apologies, um, where have I put that? Oh my God. Um, Oh, I've literally lost that. Okay, so tonight's guest is the author of uh, the best-selling World War Z, uh, the Zombie Survival Guide, uh, Minecraft novels, comics, and of course, Devolution. Um, his world building is so unique that he's been invited to many uh, military engagements, um, Naval War College, the FEMA Hurricane Drill, and San Antonio, um, at San Antonio and to the Nuclear Vibrant Response War Games. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of, um, insight given from this author down to the fact that his research is so extensive and i can't wait to chat to him about it all so please ladies and gentlemen please welcome max brooks hello max thank you so much for joining me happy birthday chris how old are you <laughs> um old enough i'm 38 on this day which would be that day yeah you made it I look every year of it as well um honestly thank you so much for joining me um it's an absolute pleasure and as you can tell how i mumbled my way through that introduction I, i'm very excited about it but uh, thank you how are you doing uh, i cannot complain so far so far so good uh hoping that as we record this let's see how it holds up uh i am i am hoping that m the american thanksgiving holiday is not a huge super spreader event i'm mm -hmm. sure it will be a bump i'm just hoping it's not uh, a 180 bump that turns everything around but we'll know by the time this thing gets broadcast absolutely because thanksgiving is from the point of recording tomorrow it is yes as we record this tomorrow families will uh, they're probably all gathering right now all across the united states so let's uh let's hope and pray everyone did their part got vaccinated and is being smart about not murdering their loved ones with <laughs> um absolutely so for someone like me if you wouldn't mind explaining because as a brit um a, a welsh person that doesn't really know much about america despite all the, the american <laughs> fans i have on the show um le let me know a little bit about what kind of um thanksgiving and what that's about thanksgiving is a, is an invented holiday for an invented country uh and i know this is difficult for for sometimes europeans and people in the old world to understand but you know the united states is not what is referred to as a nation state. And what I mean a nation state is many countries around the world are made up of nations of people, homogenous groups who look alike, sound alike, have shared beliefs uh, dating back to thousands of years ago, and they've settled on a piece of land and that becomes their state. So the nation state, England, Wales, Scotland, France, uh, Japan, these are nation states. Uh, the United States of America is not that. We are we are a patchwork of rejects from all around the world that have all come here and have all chosen to live under a shared group of beliefs. So we are a nation of ideals, and which means we have to work a little harder on our national identity than old world nation states. One of those uh, things that we have to do to work harder is create holidays. And as I understand it, we, we've created this one called Thanksgiving, which basically is 
making us all grateful to be American. This goes back to the early days when uh, the Native Americans met the Europeans and they sat together and they, they shared a peaceful dinner together and probably vowed that would be the last time. Uh, but what we do in America is we all get together. We, we gather around an indigenous dead bird uh, called a turkey. And we're all hopefully grateful for the fact that we're all together, we're all alive, and we're all American. Absolutely. I know that there are a lot of listeners, um, you know, that have been massive supporters of this show uh, in America, and I know that they're looking forward to Thanksgiving. So I hope you have a fantastic time with your families. And of course, those people celebrate Christmas and New Year's uh, over December into January. I hope you've had a great time as well. And as as we, we know, we're definitely not out of the midst of COVID, even though we're pushing on two years now of course, and hopefully the winter's been good to us uh, and not terrible. But, you know, we're still here and, um, you know, it's great mm -hmm. to get these virtual um, conversations going, of course. So, Max, let's jump into a bit of history because uh, round one, I will play the video very quickly because I always forget to do it. Um, it's called The Road to Writing. So... <laughs> So, Max, let's have a little uh, rewind of your story, if we can, and talk about how writing became something in your life, because obviously it's it's a big focal point, despite having many different um, directions in writing. I mentioned that you write comics and, and you've written for TV, uh, novels um, of different varieties. So how did that become an interest in your life? <clears throat> well, I think we have to go way back to to the dyslexic bad student child that I was. Uh, I had a, I have a learning disability. I guess now we call it a difference. Mm -hmm. But back then it was called a learning disability and it sure as hell felt like one. Uh, dyslexia means that my brain is completely rewired than most other people uh, in the way I take in information. And nothing wrong with that. But growing up in the late 70s, 1980s, uh, the education system was simply not made for me. And so I did not read for pleasure. Reading was a torture. And it was only later in life that I started reading for fun. But I always loved stories. Started with my mom reading to me every night. And uh, my mother, we should say, is, was the actress Anne Bancroft. And so when she had to go away and make a movie, she would finish recording which, whatever book she was reading to me on audio cassette. So either way, going to bed every night, I got a story. <clears throat> And around the age of 12 or 13, I saw that some of my friends were writing short stories just on their own. I said, well, what, what class is that for? They're like, oh, nothing. I just want to do that. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> so on vacation once in Italy, um, I locked myself in the back of our cabana. And I just started writing a short story. And when you're dyslexic and when you're also severely OCD and ADHD, uh, your brain's always going a million miles a second. It was one of the first times in my life that I was able to live in the moment. Mm. And I knew that's where I wanted to live the rest of my life. So from that point on, I kept writing. And I was very lucky. I was very privileged and blessed to have the kind of mom who, A, understood I was dyslexic and fought with my school every year to try to craft accommodations for how to learn and also to teach me the skills to get along. She said, you know, look, if you want to be a writer as a living, you're going to have to learn how to write. And she knew that uh, computers were the way of the future. So she forced me to take a typing class. She understood from all my testing that I don't take information as quickly through my eyes as I do through my ears. So audiobooks, she had all my, my reading recorded at the Braille Institute for the blind in Pasadena, California, so I could listen. So she gave me tools to research and also to write. And the type of writer I wanted to be was when I discovered Tom Clancy at the age of 16. Hmm. Because when you're dyslexic and school is your enemy, you don't learn a lot in school. But I was always hungry. I was, there's nothing more frustrating than being a curious mind, wanting to learn, wanting to, to grow, but not getting it at school. And when I picked up my first Clancy novel, Hunt for Red October, when I was 16, I walked away from it so much smarter. 
And I thought that's the writer I want to be. I want to be the kind of writer who educates as well as entertains. And so here I am. It's it's a fascinating story um, on many many different um, aspects. I mean, learning just to, just as you mentioned, typing with dyslexia. I mean, that's probably something not many people think about. They may think about reading with dyslexia or maybe writing. How how tricky was it to learn to to type uh, with someone with as someone with dyslexia? Uh, well, it, it wasn't easy because my handwriting was atrocious. I mean, the funny thing is, ironically, about a week ago out of a very circuitous route, because my wife is a playwright and in, in the theater world, we we somehow got in touch with my old kindergarten teacher. Wow. Still alive. And she was the one who, who calmed my mom down because I was the one who couldn't read and all the other kids could read and my mom was panicked. And apparently my teacher told me that I used to write with both hands. Wow. Now my teacher somehow understood, was able to cut through the bull crap and understand how the world really worked. And my mother said, well, we can't, can't do this. He can't do this. And the teacher said, don't worry. He can hire somebody to write for him. That you can hire. You can't mm. hire someone to think. So my teacher was great at influencing my mom, who was very clear growing up about what you, what the world can help you with and what the world cannot help you with. So my mom knew that eventually I could hire somebody to type for me, but she knew that in the beginning, I would need to do it myself. And it was not easy and I fought and I was angry and my mother said, you got to do it. I'm sorry. You just got to do it. Uh, because as we all know, especially those of us who are parents, uh, children can't always make the right decisions because they are children. So my mother forced me to do it and I'm so grateful. I, I mean, you've got to look at that in, in the possibility that had your mother not been that amazingly supportive person that she was, you know, do you think that you would ever have stepped into that world of writing if that hadn't happened? No, no, I think I would have stepped in the world of heroin uh, yeah. because there was nothing but frustration and low self-esteem. And this is the issue with kids with learning disabilities. The learning mm. disability itself is actually a very small piece of the problem. The real problems come with the frustration, the anxiety, and the low self-esteem. You know, that's those are the kids that have filled our prisons here in America uh, because they never had anybody guiding them. Because the truth is, by the time I got to graduate school, the dyslexia doesn't go away. I'm still yeah. as dyslexic as I ever was, but I was able to manage the low self-esteem and the anxiety and the frustration and have enough tools that when I was getting my master's degree, dyslexia never really got in the way. It was a, it was a bump in the road to this day. Now I'm on two think tanks. One is a government, uh, not government, it's a, a civilian national security think tank in DC and a straight up military think tank at West Point. Um, which involves a tremendous amount of work and the dyslexia is there, but I'm able to get around it. Mm. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing that, you know, that you've come through, as you mentioned, uh, disabilities and um, difficulties as they are called. Now you rightly said, you know, obviously the world has adapted a lot now that that, that is recognized in young people. Um, going back to, to your parents being very supportive, they both were very, um, they excelled as professionals in their field when you were growing up. How did that have an effect on you? Did you kind of feel that that was a pressure on you or did you kind of feel that that was something really to look up to and aim for? Uh, you know, it was a pressure, but but not a pressure to be to be exactly like them in their fields. Hmm. The pressure was twofold. The pressure was on me to work as hard as them because these are two very hardworking parents who grew up in the Great Depression who are self-made millionaires. They started with nothing. You know, my dad had his back teeth ripped out when he was a kid because it was cheaper to rip them out than to fill them. Wow. That's how poor he was. Uh, my mother's mother, my grandmother used to always brag about how rich they were in the depression because her father had a grocery store, so they never starved. That's that's being loaded in 1930s America. <laughs> <clears throat> so the, the pressure on me was not to be lazy and mediocre, but also the pressure on me was to was to not let the world try to push me into being a junior version of them. And that almost happened several times. I mean, my first book, my first book almost killed my career because the world was trying to force me into a box and it didn't mm. fit. And the world didn't want that. The, the, the audience didn't want that. My first book, The Zombie Survival Guide, is what it says it is. 
It yeah. is a book on how to survive zombies. Forget that the zombies aren't real. All the solutions are real. This is a mm. hardcore, very well-researched and detailed survival manual, regardless of whether the catalyst is real or not, because even if you don't ever see a zombie, you're going to die from what the military calls second and third order effects, dehydration, malnutrition, accidents. So this book helps you deal with that. But my, my agent, uh, the late Ed Victor, God bless him, loved me and fought for me, but never really understood what I was doing. And neither did my publisher at the time. So between the two of them, they were trying to market Mel Brooks Jr. writing a comedy book making fun of zombies and which that, is not which is which is absolutely not and it almost killed the book because the, the the conventional press murdered it as an unfunny book which it was not so that was a fair cop as, as you, you you brits say and and the, and my tribe the nerds mm. the, the the horror fans the people that i am one of hated it yeah. because they thought mel brooks's brat was taking a giant dump on something they loved. So I had to get rid of all of that, re-market myself. The pressure was on me to, to sort of market at the grassroots level, introduce the world to me and introduce the world to my book. I mean, it's, it's very apparent in, in both World War Z and Devolution and of course the survival guide that um, all the dangers within those stories could be quite realistic depend if you even withdrew say the zombies or sasquatch or whatever that might be um they're very realistic situations that for example with the covid had we gone into meltdown and panic then even more so then it you know we could be faced with those situations so is it your intention to, to deliberately make them so real that they could be transferable into the real life or is it just you know you put that much detail and research in that you make it the fictional side becomes almost reality as well, just to make it more realistic and, and gritty. No, I always, um, <clears throat> I'm always fascinated by the real world. I think it's, it's much mm. more interesting than having to make stuff up. And I, even though the catalysts, even though the threat is fake, I always make my solutions very real because really what you need to survive uh, zombies or Bigfoot or anything like that is really what you need to survive everything else because I do focus on the second and third order effects of a disaster, which is exactly right. You know, uh, I mean, you look at COVID, I don't know how it was in the UK, but in the United States, the reason we were scrambling not to fill up our hospitals was because if that were to happen, if we reached critical mass, then we're not only gonna start to lose people from COVID, we're gonna lose people from any other problem, any other medical reasons. Mm -hmm. so then the deaths would, would increase at a geometric rate. So I write about that. I write about real problems, but I always paint it with a fictional brush because also it's interesting and it's fun. And the, what I've learned is if you just lecture to people with the naked threat, you either piss them off, put them to sleep, um, or click the ego defense mechanism of denial. Well, that would never happen. So I do something fictional it's fun. It's exciting. You take people on a ride. Some people are going to take it as just that, right? Oh, if the zombies happen or if Bigfoot attacks, that would be cool. But then some people will read deeper and mm -hmm. say, huh, he's not just talking about zombies and Bigfoot, is he? What, what advice would you give someone then who might <clears throat> find themselves in a similar position as you were, where maybe they've been signed by an agent um, and they are pushing their book in a direction that they don't think that sits in? Um, have you got any advice for someone who's in that scenario? Well, I think you have to fight for who you really are if that is what you intend to be. I mean, if you're the kind of writer who just wants to sell a book and if, if someone says to you, well, if we take it in this direction, uh, you'll sell more books. And if that person is happy with that and thinks, whoa, well, and I could also, and they could also write to that direction if they don't have any issues with it, that's great. But one of the reasons I had to fight so hard is because I couldn't even do what they asked of me. Mm. Now, I can't be Mel Brooks Jr. even if I wanted to be. That's not who I am. <clears throat> That's not how I work. So trying to be Mel Brooks Jr. is a dead end. So I had to fight literally for my own career survival by being true to myself, because that's the only way I know how to write. Yeah. I mean, again, I mentioned that you write for, uh, <clears throat> written for comics, um, novels, uh, screenwriting um for the friday night show 
Um, oh, you mean you mean writing for television for Saturday Night Live? Saturday Night Live, sorry, yeah. Friday night. That was my show. Um, but basically, <laughs> you know, there's a different avenues of writing there. I want to know if you had to take one of those and only go in that direction, going down the line, and you could only write for either TV or film. Uh, oh, sorry, comics or novels. Yeah. Which one would you choose and why? Well, I think I think I'd, I'm a novelist at heart. I think that's mm. what I've always been. But there are there are sometimes stories which I don't think are served well by a novel. You know, when I wrote the story, The Harlem Hellfighters, which is a true story of African-American soldiers in World War I, government, our own government set them up to fail. Didn't want them coming home as heroes and God forbid, inspiring other black people. Uh, but they did, they came home as heroes. One of the most decorated units in the entire US Army. That had to be a visual story because race is about skin color. It's about what you see. It's about the prejudice of your eyes. And if I wrote it as a novel, I think it would be too easy for people to maybe forget. But as a comic book, as a graphic novel, every single panel, every single picture on every single page reminds you, as it reminded these soldiers, they are wearing a uniform they can never take off. Yeah. It's 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 amazing. I mean, when, when you looked at um, a different aspect of writing here, I, I kind of read that you when World War Z was optioned for a film, that you kind of, were you approached as to write that as a screenplay? No, they never, they never asked. I'm sure they thought somebody else could do a better job. And, you know, <laughs> and that's fine because, the, you know, the truth is uh, I made the movie deal as I make all my movie deals with books is to bring attention to my books. Yeah. And, and no matter what happens with the movies, if the movies mean more people are reading my books, uh, then I should be grateful and nothing else. Hmm. Did you, I, I'm assuming you've seen the film. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good movie. It had nothing to do with my book, but I, <laughs> I know that, that it's, it's weird to say this, but the truth is the fact that it went in such a different direction from my book made it much easier to watch. Yeah. Because I got much more offended watching other movies that were close to the book, but not really, you know, I mean, I, mm. and, and, I've met Paul Verhoeven. I like Paul Verhoeven. I like his movies. He's a good guy. He's a nice man. We've had very nice discussions. But I'm sorry. What he did to Starship Troopers is what Osama Bin Laden did to the Twin Towers. Wow. That was one of my favorite books. And then to watch it become Starship Troopers 90210, uh, even, even with a hint of condemning that world as fascist, which is the exact polar opposite of the book. The whole point of the book is about democracy but it's earned democracy. The point is, if mm. you don't give of yourself to society, if you don't uh, sign up for some sort of government service, doesn't have to be military or war, but if you, if you don't do something to earn your citizenship, then you still get to live a very nice, happy life in this world, but you don't get to vote. You don't get to have a say about how other people live if you haven't done your part. And that's pure democracy. So then to watch a movie where it's sort of quasi fascist with these little sort of Nazi outfits and, and kind of comedic and then the, the naked shower scene and the, the romance. It's just, I have much more gut churning moments when I think about that movie than I ever do about world war Z. Yeah. I mean, for, for a, as a fan of world war Z, you know, big, big fan of that book. Uh, first of all, the world building it is just unbelievable, and the detail you go into from the different perspectives, across, you know, all around the world. Um, when I watched World War Z, which you know, love the actors in that, it's well cast and and big production, it's fantastic. But the only similarity I really kind of picked out from it was the character, uh, our lead character, and you know, there were many many scenarios in the book, massive battles like Yonkers wasn't in there, and. I was thinking they missed a trick here. I just felt like something was missing. Uh, did you kind of feel that way? No, no, because it had nothing to do with my book. In fact, when you talk about the main character, there's no, there's no Jerry Lane in my book. As a matter of fact, I had to go to the Writers Guild and fight for the writer, J. Michael Straczynski, because they brought on so many other writers. I think they were going to take away from him. Yeah. And so I had to go and, and testify on his behalf that he created Jerry Lane. There is no Jerry Lane. Uh, in my book. In fact, I had to read them a passage in the very beginning of my book saying that that I am made it my goal to be invisible. So this whole character, which I think he's cool, you know, he's got hmm. nice hair and he's a good husband and <laughs> pancakes, but that that wasn't in the book. So it was easier for me to watch hmm. Jeff Lane 
than it was to watch Johnny Rico. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the obvious thing, and, and this is reflected throughout your books as well, the kind of diary aspect of, or the reporter aspect of your stories, I mean, that's key in, in both uh, World War Z and, of course, um, uh, Devolution. What is the insp uh, again, attraction for you to use that kind of writing format? I think uh, the diary format made it, makes it even more real. I want to make things as realistic as possible. I think, you know, maybe growing up being a huge horror and science fiction fan and having all the snobs sort of turn their noses up at it. You know, I, I'll never forget when I was 14, uh, our English teacher let us all, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to do you all a favor. I'm going to let you all do your next book report on the book of your choice. And a friend of mine, Mr. Rock and Roll with his mullet and his heavy metal t-shirt was like, there's a Stephen King book I'd really like to do a book report on. Not only did the teacher shut him down, he then shamed him by giving a lecture to the entire class about how Stephen King is not literature. Wow. And so I thought, well, congratulations, numbnuts. You just <laughs> stopped a kid from reading. Wow, way to be a teacher. Uh, and you've also just slammed a writer that probably has made God knows how many tens of millions of Americans start to read who never would have picked up a book in their lives. Mm -hmm. So I have always wanted to be as realistic as possible for no other reason than to defend the genre that I hold so dear in my heart. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when you look at the the genre in question, I read mm -hmm. something that you had bought the zombie genre into the mainstream. Do you think that's true? Or do you kind of think that Romero, for example, had already done that? I think I, yeah, I think Romero's already done that. I mean, Romero's, Romero's 10 times the storyteller I could ever be. I mean, I think Dawn of the Dead is one of the greatest movies ever made. I mean, if you want to talk about a movie that encapsulates who we are as a country, the social commentary look no farther. I think that, I think it certainly says more about his generation than Easy Rider ever did. And I think, uh, in, in the footsteps of Romero is Shaun of the Dead, mm -hmm. because if you want to find one single movie that encapsulates a generation of Britons in the post Thatcher era, sort of the Gen Xers of Britain, it's that movie because you know, I, I love the, the, the cutesy little Hugh Grant romantic comedies. And uh, yes, I love you, but you love me. And the love, and we're loving him with love, the love. That's great. But, but that doesn't tell me anything about who these people are. Like in my country in the 90s, we had the movie Clerks. Mm -hmm. Which basically just said, this is Generation X. Bam. Now, on the other side of the Atlantic, you had Shaun of the Dead. Bam. You have a country, Great Britain, which had this imperial glorious past then had this sort of smashing decline and had the the Beatles era, yay, the swinging 60s, who needs the empire? And then the punk movement, which was like, this sucks. We have no future. And then you have the Thatcher era trying to claw your way back to the imperial glory. And then you have this next generation. What's it all about? Who are we? What do we want? Where are we going? And that's Shaun of the Dead. Hmm. So between Romero and Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg, uh, I'm in the wrong business. I got a lot of catch <laughs> to do. I mean, if we look at the the whole evolution of a zombie, I guess. I mean, you yourself, um, I, you know, actually, if you look back, Romero zombies and, and Shaun of the Dead, they're all very slow and almost lethargic, but they crowd around and the mass numbers trap people, that sort of thing. Yeah. Going to say 28 Days Later, and in fact, the film World War Z, they're all kind of really hyperactive and, and very fast and aggressive. Yep. What's your take on that? Which, which do you kind of prefer yourself as a fan? Fast zombies don't scare me. Hmm. Because the greatest weapon a zombie can have is being underestimated. And I was, I've been saying this since World War, we can say Zed, since World War Zed came out. But also, uh, look at COVID. If COVID had been a fast zombie, in that if people were literally just dying on the streets, if people were keeling over in the tube, grasping their throats and clawing for breath, uh, we would have knocked COVID out in the first three months. You know, Ebola is a fast zombie. And the reason Ebola has not ripped through uh, Europe and America and Japan, the reason it stayed contained, in fact, the reason the United States Army went into Africa to fight Ebola was because it was so scary. That's the fast zombie. I don't think you could ever have a fast zombie outbreak take over the world. 
because it would ring the alarm bells. The slow zombie is very easy to underestimate. And yeah. Romero is very clear about how stoppable they are, which is why people don't take them seriously. And then it gets out of control. And that's COVID. A, it's, it's no worse than the flu. Don't worry about it. You know, well, I don't know about over on your side, but I can tell you we've lost more Americans than almost all our wars put together. And I think technically all of our combat deaths put together mm. every war. That's really serious. It, it, when you put it into that perspective, it really is mind blowing. And as I mentioned, ho fingers crossed that over the winter, when th before this was recorded or after this was recorded, you know, hope things have panned out. But if I'm being completely honest, countries are locking down again. Yeah. So as you mentioned, if it was more threatening, we probably would have combated that by now or, or tried to. But we're we're still open. We're still shopping. We're still going to these events. I mean, it is it is a very much serious thing on our doorstep. And as you mentioned the slower, the scarier, I guess. Yeah, that's exactly right, which is why I make my zombies slow and easily stopped. Because also, if they're easily stopped, uh, then therefore their victory is our defeat. I, yeah. mean, I, think that, I think the best line ever is in Dawn of the Dead, in the very beginning, when the, she's in the TV station, when Fran is in the TV station, and they're all tearing their hair out, trying to figure out how this is all spinning out of control. And... One TV tech says, I, I think we're, we're losing. And she says, yeah, but not to the enemy. We're blowing it ourselves. Well, I mean, I'm going to take that line directly and put it on the COVID movie of the week that we're all going to have to watch in like a few years. Uh, it, was, it wasn't even a few years. Michael Bay did it last year. Yeah, well, of course. I'm sure he did. I, uh, come on. I mean, that was so poorly, poorly timed. Um, okay. What we're going to do is we are going to put part two on and we're going to talk about your book, Devolution, um, which involves Sasquatch, which is very fascinating. <laughs> um, so let's get into it. So as you can see up in the top corner, Max Brooks Devolution, the book is there with the massive red footprint. Uh, Max, let everybody know that's watching what is devolution all about? All right. Well, to people in the UK, it is not about Scottish political independence. I'm very sorry about that. We had my poor publishers in the UK were just uh, giving themselves <laughs> ulcers, trying to come up with an alternative title. We went back and we went forth. And I said to them, look, this is the best title. This is the title I came up with years and years ago. I'm so sorry. If you want me to, I will do a Scotland apology tour. Oh, why wouldn't that be amazing? To allay any confusion but it is not about <clears throat> political independence what it is about is sasquatch yeah it, it starts with an eco community in washington state in the united states of america <clears throat> a very um high-end highbrow eco community uh it is nestled in the cascade mountains out in the wilderness but it doesn't feel like the wilderness because with modern green technology these people can live an urban life in a rural setting. These are, these are telecommuters. These are lawyers. These are uh, executives. These are psychologists, professors. And they get up in the morning and they telecommute to work. They teach their classes. And then at lunch, they go for a wonderful walk in the woods, maybe pick a blueberry off a, tree, uh, a bush. They tap on their phone, and which sends a signal to Seattle and a drone delivers their groceries and they've got solar power and they've got Wi-Fi. And once a week, an electric driverless van brings in the gardeners and the handyman and everything, everybody who fixes up the community. And it really is an idyllic setting until um, Mount, the volcano Mount Rainier erupts. And the good news is they're not buried in lava because the volcano blows out the other way towards Seattle. But the bad news is they're cut off because they're now trapped between the volcano and the mountains. And because Mount Rainier is causing the greatest natural disaster in American history, they're not just cut off, they're forgotten because they're outside the blast zone. So no one's looking for them and communications are cut and winter is coming. And these high paid, highly educated, intellectual fops 
have no idea how to change a light bulb. So if that's not the least of their problems, to try and scratch out a living to survive this brutal winter, <clears throat> the eruption has also driven a pack of very hungry, very large Sasquatch creatures out of their traditional foraging grounds. And they need to stock up on calories for the winter too. Mm -hmm. And they come up against this pen of sheep that is this eco community. So what might have been a fight for survival turns into a battle for survival. It, what, what I'm loving about this story um, is the fact that, again, the realistic, the scenario that we all put ourselves in and possibly preppers or people who think, oh, I've got a plan for the zombie apocalypse, what it really comes down to is without technology these days, we probably wouldn't survive a few weeks. No, you know, we wouldn't, just, we wouldn't know how to, <laughs> to make food and, and prepare food and store water. I mean, it really does show that without these technologies that we're so reliant on now, we would just be walking around clueless as a species. Uh, you know, it, Britain and America are very similar in that we are at the pinnacle of, of first world civilization. And the fact that we have become so soft and pampered and dumb that we actually refer to anybody who does just a little bit of stocking up or a little bit of emergency planning work, we have to refer to them as preppers, right? <clears throat> now, when my father was a kid, everybody did that. Mm. They didn't call it disasters. They called it hard times. There were good times, there were hard times. <clears throat> when I was a kid, my grandmother would never let me drink a whole glass of grape juice. You had to put half grape juice and half water because she would say, you gotta make it last. Right, there were always leftovers. You never wasted anything. You knew how to fix everything in your home because money was precious and you couldn't afford to always just hire somebody to do stuff you could do yourself. That wasn't disaster prepping. That was just being sensible. But nowadays, if you live that kind of life, people think you're some crazed redneck hiding under the bed with a shotgun and canned beans waiting for the apocalypse. You're right. and. <laughs> What's amazing is that when people panicked in the UK, they all rushed out and bought toilet paper. That is the most bizarre thing I can ever think of. It's something that you, A, don't use to survive, and B, runs out anyway. Um, but you're right. I mean, there was often times where I've put bottles of water in the garage, and I'm you know, discussing this with my wife as to why I'm doing it, and it's just a preparation of having bottles of water in case water supplies and it, there was a there was a reason behind that but again you, you i was feeling unusual about doing that and that i was doing something socially <clears throat> awkward oh yeah i mean and a few generations ago every britain knew how to get through the day and make things less there's a wonderful exhibit in the imperial war museum or it might be the cabinet war rooms it might be the cabinet war rooms uh which just talks about food right it's mm. not sexy and dramatic it's not churchill you know with the big map it's just about how do we make elderberry wine and how do we stretch out our pudding a little bit to last a week. Uh, those little things that everybody knew how to do. And no one knows how to do any of that now. Uh, and, and let me just say for the record, I believe in globalization, right? I believe in technology. I believe in trade. I believe in going forward. I, I, I can't stand those people who glorify the past. Right. That's no, no, no. I want an oncologist if I'm ever in the shower and find a lump on my ball. I want this. What I also want, in addition to all this wondrous technology, is a backup plan. Yeah. You know, if I if I do purchase a driverless car, what where, where is the kill switch in case it goes crazy or in case, God forbid, someone hacks it? That's all I'm asking is just a backup plan and a little backup tech. I mean, that is a scary thought because that is a very realistic thing that's happening very soon, right? And you drive this cars and the idea of hacking that is, is kind of a crazy thing when you're sat in the back without a driver. And that's that. And at this point, I have seen no evidence that the driverless car companies are planning for this because part of my think tank work is going to these conferences and hearing about this technology. And wow. scientists, techies, they're all positive. And when you combine that sort of myopic positivity with, with the nuclear power of capitalism, you don't want to be the guy in the room raising your hand saying, well, what do you do? 
As a matter of fact, in Devolution, I do have that story about the guy talking about hacking his hand to play the piano and talking about making a cyber suit. Mm -hmm. That was real. That was all real. I was there. I saw the guy. He talked about his cyber suit, how great it would be. And of course, being the dick that I am, I raised my hand and said, what will, who's to blame if that suit is hacked? And the hacker tells that suit to pick up an assault rifle because it's America and walk down the street to the local preschool. Who's to blame? And the scientist looked at me like, why are you even here? And he just said, oh, it's the hacker's fault. No responsibility whatsoever. Yeah, that's not a contingency plan. That is literally out of the book as as word for word. And uh, I was reading that and I was thinking, that's amazing. And it's I didn't realize that was a thing and that could be done. So, wow, mind blown. Um, yeah, so let's get back to devolution because that was a big segue there. Um, what, first of all, why, why Sasquatch? Oh, Sasquatch scares the crap out of me. Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, Coming up in the in the late seventies, early eighties, there was that was the the sort of beginning of the Sasquatch craze, and they used to put on all these like faux documentaries on. And when you're a little kid, growing up in a ranch style home with giant plate glass windows, and the trees are rustling outside in the night, and your bathtub is built into the floor next wow. to the window, what do you think's going to happen? Oh as, man! As you're, as you're literally watching a giant furry fist smash through the window trying to grab the woman so that's a childhood fear yeah but it became an adult opportunity to talk about uh interconnectivity survival technology uh all these big important subjects that mean a lot to my adult self and so my child self gave me the way to do it Mm. so you've got as you mentioned in this book that you've got the very highly tech group of people that are completely isolated and it's about them surviving a figuring out how to survive without technology and then be running into these you know creatures that have come scavenging themselves yeah. um so and again that's written from a diary perspective from two sides there um how does this differ to writing say world war z and did you change kind of your wrote, writing approach there what was that like yeah i had to change the writing approach because see world war z i wrote out of order because okay. I, had, I had to do so much eclectic research for world war z each story had to have its own amount of research so i they were all coming at me at the same time so i wrote whichever story i thought was the freshest and hottest and begging to be written which made mm. the first draft of writing world war z awesome yeah second draft was a beast because <laughs> i then had to put it all in order and get all the logic flaws right and the timeline right. And then sometimes I realized like I had invented a rule in chapters three, let's say that nullified all of chapter six. Okay. So like, for example, in world war, in world war Z, uh, I have, I have the uh, resource to kill ratio. Now that came later. That was one of the later chapters I wrote in the first draft as I sort of looked at the whole book and looked at the whole war and thought, oh, wait, this is, this is a war of resources. This is a war of numbers and a war of, of mass. So I have to make sure that the winner is very frugal. But then I went back and I had a whole thing on, on mines and booby traps. And I had Mm. all this wild uh, technology, which simply was not feasible in this war of frugality. So then what I had to do was take some of that chapter, I scrapped most of the chapter, took one little piece out about laser weaponry and put it in the chapter about making movies to boost morale, in which our guy, our filmmaker says, these laser weapons are completely uh, uneconomical, but you put them on film and they pay tremendous dividends in lifting people's hearts. Now, with, with devolution, I had to write it all in a linear fashion. Yeah. So, and all the research had to be done at the front end, and that that made a tougher first draft. It made second and third drafts a little bit easier because I had a, a, a linear story to work on. So, what would be your kind of writing process? Are you a big planner and a big plotter, or do you kind of write? I'm a huge, oh my God, right. I'm, for those watching, I'm going to turn the camera and you're going to see all. Wow. 
the whiteboards. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, that's what I do. And there's two sides. So I have to plan everything, maybe because of my dyslexia, maybe because I don't, I have, you know, I don't trust my intellect. So I have mm. to keep where I'm going. Part of it is also because the, some of the research determines the plot. Yeah. I mean, there, there are little things like for devolution, I had to do everything. I did everything my characters did. Uh, and, and I am glad we are watching this, you know, for your viewers, we initially were going to do audio and you yes. very lightly. <laughs> can we please do video? Well, it's good because now you can see like this is <sighs> one of the weapons I had to build to see if I could do it. Because wow. if I can't do this. If I can't make this weapon with nothing but uh, bamboo, the sobakiri, wire from a lamp and a rock, uh, then my characters can't do it. Likewise, I, I had to go to where Green Loop is because that's a big plot point when they're trapped. Mm. Because anybody reading this book is able to just walk out. Is it as isolated as you make out in the book? It is so isolated I couldn't walk in. Wow. And I'm an experienced hiker. I'm an experienced hiker and camper. I know what I'm doing. I couldn't get in there. Uh, certainly, I couldn't get in there alone without risking injury. If I had had a group, uh, maybe. But no, I had to. I had to do that. So those are the big dramatic pieces of research. But then some are very mundane, but so important. Hmm. Uh, when the characters plant their little greenhouse in the garage, I had to do that. I had to get a little patch of dirt and grow every single seed that they grew, not from a gardening store, right? I had to, I, like them, I had to go through my fridge and my pantry and see, could I plant these things? And then I had to keep a very detailed calendar to see at what stage they grew, because you don't want to get busted by saying, oh, you know, day 19, the beans are starting to come up and then have somebody reading and saying, beans would come up way before that, dude. <laughs> I know it must be very difficult to get the accuracy of these things right and the extensive research you've done there is absolutely amazing I'm so impressed with that um but like Andy Weir with the Martian for example he does something very much garden-like but on a crazy scale and I'm wondering just how much detail on research you put into that and how many people are actually judging that research you know I think I, I trust him I, mm. I think I don't know him very well I've met him once but Knowing the history of the book, I think this guy, this guy reminds me of Clancy in that he genuinely loves it. He loves what he's doing, he cares about what he's doing, and he takes, and he's excited by the truth. Andy Weir seems like the kind of guy who would be excited to prove that you could actually do it. Otherwise, why write the book? He seems like the kind of guy who said, God, how could someone really survive on Mars? And that is a, is a tremendous respect for the work and if and if the author respects the work i respect the author i mean i i kind of get i think i know the answer to this already but if you could give advice to someone who wants to write something and wants to know how to research more efficiently what advice would you give them i don't well i don't know if i'm an efficient researcher that I, <laughs> probably not but i mean i can tell you just for me <clears throat> i always try to go to primary source mm -hmm. so like, like I said, I either I have to physically do some of this stuff myself to see if it can be done. But then there's stuff I can't do. I got to go talk to experts. Like with Mount Rainier erupting, I had to cold call the United States Geological Survey and talk to people. And I'm totally socially awkward. This took a lot, a lot of, uh, of guts on my part to sort of get over my, my shyness <laughs> and call these people and then reach out to other people and take their notes. And that changed the book around because I had initially imagined it the volcano as sort of mount saint helens blowing and just fire and ash and blotting out the sun and talking to these volcanologists said no 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 rainier's a completely different volcano the danger in rainier is the lahars mm -hmm. <clears throat> the the boiling mudslides and then they they showed me that their website actually has a map of the predicted where the lahars would go wow which then told me where i would put green loop so the research cascaded in that way. One thing led to another. So in my mind, and this comes from, I guess, getting my degree in history. I think that made me a better researcher mm -hmm. because my professors would always say primary source. Don't, don't, mean, screw, don't screw around with what the internet says or what someone tells you. Go to the source. And that obviously influenced the story itself as well because <laughs> you, you, one of your character's fears is based on 
you know, the whole, the whatever you call it, I apologize, the, the mudslides that are coming down, yeah. that's an integral part of the, the character sphere as well. So that drives not only the story direction, but the character direction too. It does, it does. There, there's, there is cosmetic research sometimes, which, you know, you can fill in later. Like I, I did a lot of that in, in World War Z. Uh, you know, the nickname of a fighter bomber. Don't really need to know that in the moment. I'll go back and find that. But then there is the research that really does dictate where the story is going. Mm -hmm. I think that's very critical. And when I see an author who doesn't do that, that shows me a laziness and a disrespect of the work. And if they don't respect their work enough to do the homework, why should I be bothered to read it? Fantastic. Okay. Last 10 minutes, what I'm going to do is press play on part three video, and then we're going to get a couple of questions that have been sent in um, and a couple of questions from myself too. So Max, you might find some of these a bit um, uh, off topic and you might find some of these um, possibly covered what we've spoken about already but I'll pass with those if we have done. Um, first one for me, if you could take any character from the world of fiction and put them into any story, what character would you choose and why? If I, uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, if I could take any character from the world of fiction and put them in, an, in if I do that? Yeah, you can put them into a new story or one of your own or, or any other story. Which fictional character would you choose? Oh God, that's a, that's a good one. Well, I, I will say this: one of the one of the books I read for pleasure, just just for fun, to you know, just enjoy, is the works of Guy N. Smith, and okay. he does he's like the the pulp he's like the seventies pulp horror guy, and he came out with one recently about killer baboons let loose in Wales, and then it just ended, and I'm so mad at him, and I'm like. God damn it, guy! Come on, man. You're. I love your works, and there's the, the the baboons, and they're killing people. So I want to, I want to take the baboons, and and go farther. There's so much more he could do. Y you got me, dude. I'm with you. When you say they they ended in Wales, I mean I need to read this now. Yes, it's I think. Uh, it's out there and the baboons, are, well, because like in the 70s, some people have like an exotic baboon pet couple, male and female, they let them go. And then 30 years later, they're rampaging. And then the rampage just like stops. They shoot a couple of them. And then the troops sort of, you know, I won't say how it ends, but basically you'll see when you read it, you'll be like, that's it? <laughs> that can't be it. That can't be it, dude. Oh. And, and I say this as a fan, not, not as a critic. Yeah. Right. I say this. So what I would do is I would take the baboons mm -hmm. and I would keep the story going. Now, knowing Guy and Smith as I do, because he'll write 75 books about one thing. Yeah. You know, and each book will be like 150 pages. So I'm praying to God that book two is on the way uh, because I'm waiting for it, man. Guy, what? I love you. Come on, dude. You can do this. We'll have to send a Twitter ambush out there and get him to do that. Um, as we as we mentioned there, I'll ask this question out of order. But um, of course, mentioned finishing in Wales. Uh, obviously, the film of World War Z, Z whichever uh, you do yeah. prefer. Um, from Matt Adcock, he is a great film buff. And he says, how did you feel about the Welsh ending to the film of World War Z? Um, because A, that blew my mind in the cinema. And B, obviously, um, how did you feel about that? Well, honestly, I don't think it it was uh, it didn't have to be Wales. Yeah. In in that way, whereas like in my book when I write about castles, uh, there are some badass castles in Wales. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you're gonna if you're gonna use Wales, use Wales. Yeah. There's got to be something because what I do is I don't just pick things willy nilly. You know, I wrote a comic book, The Extinction Parade, Zombies and Vampires. I put it in Malaysia for, for very specific reasons about the geography, the history, the culture, the economics. So, like, there's a lot of reasons to put something in Wales, like a killer baboon story. Even Guy Smith did that. Because the land, the terrain is still rough enough and hilly enough and forested enough that the killer baboons could wreak havoc where they say they couldn't in the low countries in England. Yeah. It, it really did blow my mind. I, I, I was sat in the cinema in a town not far from Cardiff and everyone went, 
what? <laughs> you know, kind of that shock moment. And then they walk through some little uh, valley street up into a random building. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was a bonkers one. Uh, thanks for that question, Matt. Um, okay, back to the question I was going to ask. If you could change the ending, and I, you've kind of already answered this one uh, to any story, what ending would you change? And it doesn't have to be a bad one or a good one. You can choose yep. any ending. We've said that. Uh, the new Guy and Smith Killer Baboon book. Give me about 200 more pages, man. <laughs> yep. Tick. Don't change the ending. Just just don't end it. Just don't end it. Uh, okay. What one person would you like to go on an adventure with? Oh, I'll tell you exactly who. His name is Les Stroud. He's a friend of mine. We've since become friends after the book came out. He is Survivor Man. Yeah. <clears throat> he is the first guy ever to do to do the reality show about surviving in the wilderness. And so many people that came after him are such shameless frauds who go out there with a camera crew and they've all been outed. So there's no point in, in slamming them. But like I got my start working in documentaries for the BBC. That was my first out of job, out of college job. I know how documentaries work. There's a lot of BS involved, not Les Stroud. He goes out by himself wow. with his camera equipment. And he spends a lot of time training for it with local people to know how to survive off the land. And a good portion of the time, he utterly fails. He says, this is too hard. If I keep pushing this, I'm going to hurt myself. And this is a show about how to survive. And part of surviving is knowing when not to push yourself. So, and then I met him because, you know, growing up in Hollywood, I'm always afraid to meet people because most of them are frauds. So I make it a point not to meet my heroes. Les was different. He's the real deal. He's really into this. He said to me when we first met, he goes, you know, I got I to gotta confess to you. I'm making these documentaries. I'm out there by myself. And the first night I'm always like, what am I doing? Why did yeah. I, I want to go home? Uh, so if I was going to go on an adventure, I would have him and I'd have one other guy, two guys. The other is Benedict Allen. When I talk about working for the BBC, I worked on a show called Great Railway Journeys in East Africa with an actual explorer, a guy who actually still, he was in the Amazon, almost died, trekked through Namibia on his own. He is a hardcore, <clears throat> old fashioned English explorer, right down to the fact that his body is carpeted with little cuts as a rite of passage in New Guinea. Wow. So I've worked with him. And if I had him on one side and Les Stroud on the other, I could go anywhere on this planet. I've seen the documentary about those cats and that is not a pleasant experience. I can imagine that. Wow. Amazing. That is a great answer. Um, okay. This, this word we mentioned earlier, uh, do you think that the prepper survivalists have an advantage in a zombie apocalypse? Thank you, Anya, for that question. Not at all. Not at all. It depends on who they are. It depends on what kind of survivalists they are. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're the kind of survivalist who is just all about machismo and guns and ammo and, t and testosterone. And if they want this to happen, they'll be dead on day three. Or can I swear? Yeah, absolutely. All right. These guys, I know these guys. I've met these guys constantly. Most of them are young men. Uh, as, as the American comedian Trey Crowder refers to, pudgy and mediocre. <laughs> they hate society because... They can't su survive in it. So they want society to collapse. So then they think that they will rise from the ashes like a phoenix, right? They think all they need is a little bit of anarchy. And then they can be the awesome Call of Duty video game hero that they know they're born to be. On day three, they're either going to be dead or sucking cock for raw turnips. <laughs> Oh, wow. Absolutely amazing answer. I mean, let's be honest, if it was going to happen, it's probably when you're driving halfway down the road to go to work or something, and then you're completely out of your plan anyway. Right. Well, um, any, and anybody who thinks that they're just going to blast and shoot their way out of it, I invite them to look at the average age of the average Somali warlord. Because you want to look at the zombie apocalypse, you don't have to look into my books or anyone else's fiction just look at today's failed states and see how long these tough guys last because yeah. that's you buddy wow what an answer okay we are in the last minute of this show so what i'm going to ask you one more sh well i'm going to ask you two very quick ones um what was the last book or film that you watched or read god the 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 last one the last 
movie I just watched was a, a day ago, and it was Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in America. Okay. And it kind of blew me away when I it, when it comes to the Me Too movement, when it comes to sort of old men getting Me Tooed and saying I grew up in a different time, grew up in a different time, you know. Wow, that was a different time. Yeah. When, the treatment of women in this movie, which was apparently totally okay uh, for that time. And I thought, oh my God, we really did grow up in a different time. Mm. And thank God the times they are changing. And as far as I'm concerned, they can't change fast enough. <laughs> I watched that a long, long time ago, so I imagine it isn't maybe not held up very well with what you're suggesting. There. Um, okay, last question for me: What would you sing at a karaoke night? Oh, what would I sing karaoke night? Oh God! Well, you, uh, let me just state for the record: I have the absolute worst taste in music. Okay, I'm not. I'm not ashamed of it. You know, uh, it is who I am. You know, my dad has great taste. My dad still listens to jazz from the '40s. God bless him. You know, my son, 16. He's influenced by his mom, listening to like Stevie Wonder and some classic stuff. I am a product of my time. So if it's from 1987 to 1990, I'm in it. So bring on the Wang Chung. Uh, and not even like the good stuff, like everybody have fun tonight. Like I will sing the, I will hum <laughs> the soundtrack to Live and Die in LA on karaoke night. Fantastic. Um, guys, thank you for tuning in max i can't explain uh, how happy i am to have had this conversation with you i uh, thank you so much for coming on um guys please check out devolution it's fantastic and uh, you won't be disappointed if you have not read world war z or z um uh, it's a must read as well as the survival guide so max brooks's website i'll put a link in the description go check it out um in the about section of that website there's a beautiful picture of you holding a massive machete sword i have many I have, yeah. If you're going to write about machetes, you better get to know them. So that's why I have about 30 to 35, I think, machetes. And it's funny you should say that. I got the best one right here. That's. I think that might be what you're holding on there. Uh, well, nothing Nothing matches a good uh, Blackie Collins vintage Ontario machete because he didn't make it to be cool. He didn't make it to cosplay. He made it to chop down brush. This is a tool which meant that it will endure. So wow. my machete. I need to do some scrubbing up on machetes. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, please like the show if you haven't already. And if you leave comments or on Twitter, um, message Max if you uh, enjoyed the show as well. But thank you from both of us. Max, thank you from me. And I am going to celebrate the rest of my birthday, I imagine, after this. So uh, see you all soon, guys. Please stay safe. Bye from us. Take care, everyone.